well, whatever field of clinical practice you work in, it's a guarantee you are going to come across patients in pain. Whether you work in acute care, in the surgical setting, in the A&E setting, elderly care, community care, palliative care, wherever you work, there are going to be patients in pain. So it's fundamental that we must understand something about pain, how we assess it, and how we're going to treat it. We have to have a feel for this subject of pain. So let's just start off with a bit of an introduction and we'll look at some terminology and a few basic concepts. Now, pain is described as nociceptic, or one type of pain is described as nociceptic pain. So what do we mean by nociceptic pain? Well, the nociceptors are free nerve endings in tissues and they're connected up to the central nervous system but they're free nerve endings that are sensitive to pain and they're actually sensitive to tissue damage. So when there's an impulse to the tissues that's bad enough to start damaging this, those tissues, the nociceptors will generate a brand new nerve impulse which will take an electrical ner nerve signal up to the brain where it will be interpreted and felt as pain. And this process whereby a nociceptor experiences an external stimulus and generates a new nerve impulse, a brand new nerve impulse, that is called transduction. So new nerve impulses are transducted from environmental stimuli in the nociceptors, generating brand new nerve impulses that then go off to the brain. Now you might have noticed it hurts if someone pokes you in the kidneys very painful. Well the reason for this is the renal capsule is very rich in nociceptors. It contains a lot of nociceptors so a stimulus to the renal capsule is going to cause pain. If you've broken a bone you know that's very painful or even if you bash your shin that's very painful because the periosteum contains a lot of nociceptors. It's rich in nociceptors so that tissue is able to generate a lot of pain. The dermis of the skin contains a lot of nociceptors, that's why it hurts so much if you cut yourself or graze your skin or get a burn, it's the nociceptors in the dermis that are generating the pain. Patients don't like arterial punctures because arterial walls contain a lot of nociceptors. The parietal pleural membranes contain a lot of nociceptors, that's why chest drains are so painful. And the peritoneal membranes, particularly the outside peritoneal membrane, contains a lot of nociceptors. So the outside pleural membrane, the outside peritoneal membrane, containing a lot of nociceptors, giving rise to a lot of pain. But other tissues contain very few or no nociceptors. So you might, for example, have seen a biopsy from the inside of the stomach where a bit of gastric mucosa can be ripped out to take a biopsy and the patient doesn't flinch, they don't feel it because that inside layer doesn't contain nociceptors so it doesn't generate pain when it's damaged. And the really clever thing about transduction in nociceptors is that when a new nerve impulse is generated the nociceptor will depolarize. There will be a reversal of the polarity and that will be transmitted from the nociceptor up towards the central nervous system and towards the brain. But that transduction, that depolarization that generates a new nerve impulse, the threshold for when that new nerve impulse is generated is set at where the tissues are starting to be damaged. Because what pain is for is to prevent tissue damage. That's the main reason we feel pain, to prevent tissue damage. So most people, if you put their hand in water at 45 degrees centigrade, they'll be able to tolerate it for a little while, then they'll say, oh, this is starting to hurt, and they'll take it out. Because if your hand is at 45 degrees centigrade for a period of time, the tissues of your hand will start to be damaged. So the pain is generated at the same point that the tissues start to be damaged. But if you think about it, if you splash boiling water on yourself, well, that's going to be very painful straight away. That's because boiling water will damage the tissues very quickly and you're immediately going to get tissue damage. So you're immediately alerted 
with a painful stimulate with a painful stimulus going to the brain as the nociceptors depolarize they transduce the environmental stimulus into an electrical nerve impulse but the threshold is set just where we need it to protect the tissues so pain can be nociceptic from the nociceptors and this is the most common source of pain we come across but pain can also be neuropathic now neuropathic comes from the nerves themselves so nociceptic pain starts with a nociceptor but if you for example if you've bashed your funny bone that can hurt can't it because that's where the ulnar nerve goes round about your elbow joint and that's a form of neuropathic pain the pain is coming from the nerve rather than coming from the nociceptors so pain can be nociceptic or, or neuropathic and the experience of pain is not constant for example there's a condition called hyperalgesia now algesia means pain and if a tissue is inflamed for example there will be hyperalgesia a particular stimulus is going to cause pain whereas that particular stimulus would not the nociceptors can be sensitized so transduction occurs more readily the depolarization threshold of the nociceptors will be lowered meaning a particular stimulus which normally doesn't cause pain will cause pain because we've got hyperalgesia so for example if you've ha ever had a urinary tract infection the mere, pack, the mere fact of passing urine causes dysuria painful burning experience because the tissues are inflamed and just the normal passage of urine is enough to cause quite a lot of pain because there's hyperalgesia in those tissues well if you've seen patients with arthritis painful joints a, a movement that for you causes no pain at all for that patient can cause a lot of pain because the joint capsules which are rich in nociceptors are hyperalgesic the depolarization depolarization threshold is lowered meaning transduction occurs more easily and the patient gets a a painful stimulus there's a hyperalgesia now the converse of hyperalgesia is analgesia so an means without algesia means pain now the body has its own analgesic systems that we're going to learn about later but also you frequently give analgesics drugs to reduce pain an means without gesia pain literally without pain analgesics of course don't always remove pain completely but hopefully they're going to reduce it now pain can also be modulated modulation of pain now the amount of tissue damage that someone experiences and the amount of pain that they feel does not have a linear relationship it's not that a little bit of tissue damage causes a little bit of pain a greater amount of tissue damage causes more pain a lot of tissue damage causes a lot of pain it's not a simple linear relationship it's affected by many things there are many factors that can reduce the amount of pain a patient experiences for a particular amount of tissue damage or there's factors that can increase the amount of pain so the amount of pain can be increased or decreased depending on various circumstances and again we're going to look at these later later in this in this dvd but remember pain and tissue damage the relationship is not simple because a painful stimulus is modulated from where the nociceptor generates the pain to the part of the brain that feels the pain there is going to be modulation now another term that's often mentioned in the context of pain is referred a referred pain now a referred pain is a pain that is felt somewhere other than where it is generated so most people know the heart's going to be round about here but myocardial pain can often be felt in the left shoulder the left arm going up into the neck going down there's a distribution of myocardial pain where it can be felt pain can be referred and there's many other examples in clinical practice and we have to learn these so for example perhaps someone with gallbladder pain 
might experience the pain in their right scapula, which seems strange, but the pain is referred to a different part of the body. But it's very often referred in a predictable way, so we can learn these patterns. So a referred pain simply means a pain which is experienced in part of the body other than where that pain was generated. Probably quite a few of you have heard the term um, phantom pain. This is fairly well known about. A phantom pain is a pain which is felt in part of the body which no longer exists. So a patient could have had an arm amputated or a leg amputated, yet they still feel pain in that non-existent limb, which is very strange, but explained by the fact that the body is represented in the sensory cortex. So that is a phantom pain. Now, it's useful to think about the components of pain. How is a pain sort of made up? Well, obviously, there's a sensory component to the pain. That is what the patient actually feels, the pain itself. And they'll often describe this. Maybe it's a sharp pain. Maybe it's a, an achy pain. Maybe it's a gripping or a heavy pain. Maybe it's a twisting pain. Patients will describe the sensory component of the pain what they actually feel, the painful experience itself. But pain also has a very strong affective component. Now, affect means to do with mood or emotion. Pain is upsetting. It causes anxiety. It's distressing. It's a horrible experience. And that horrible experience is more than just the pain. It's the distress that goes with the pain. So there's an affective component as well as a sensory component. And there's also an autonomic component. So the autonomic nervous system is the automatic part of the nervous system, and particularly the sympathetic autonomic nervous system is going to respond to pain. So the patient in pain may have an increased heart rate that can be tachycardic. They can be hypertensive, their blood pressure can go up. Their respiratory rate can go up. They can become sweaty. They can be an autonomic expression of the pain. And pain also has a motor component as well to do with movement. Now, an obvious one is that people will withdraw from pain. If something's hurting, they'll pull their limb away. There'll be withdrawal. And other times when patients are in pain, they kind of writhe around. We talk about people writhing in agony, and, and that does happen. You see this in, in, in our patients who have severe pain. And yet other patients with some types of pain will lie very still to minimise the pain. And whatever expression of pain we have, we normally like to tell other people that we're in pain. Now, you do get some stoical patients that will just suffer in silence. But normally we vocalise the pain. There's a motor response in terms of vocalisation. We like to tell other people about our pain. So motor components, lying still, moving around, withdrawal, vocalising in response to pain. Now what about descriptions of pain? How are we going to describe pain? Well, pain is often described as being acute or being chronic. And what we normally say, acute pain is generated in response to some tissue damage, although we have said that might not be a linear relationship, it can be modulated, or pain can be chronic. And what we do here is we just make up a completely arbitrary period of time and we say that a chronic pain is a pain which has been there for more than three months. It's a fairly arbitrary distinction, but it's what we normally say. So an acute pain is in response to tissue injury or some pathological process affecting the tissues, whereas a chronic pain is present for more than three months. Sometimes we describe pain as being superficial or deep, and that's exactly what it says. A superficial pain would involve the surface of the body, whereas a deep pain could be from the bones or from the organs. And the pain often feels like it's deep inside, as opposed to a superficial pain. So if we ask our patients where is the pain, they can normally tell us whether it's superficial or deep, which of course can give us some very useful um, clinical information, especially if we're trying to diagnose what's wrong with the patient at the time. Now, another useful concept is pain threshold, the pain threshold. 
The pain threshold is the point at which the patient first becomes aware of the pain. So how much do you have to damage a tissue? How much do you have to heat a tissue? How much do you have to put, how much electric current do you have to put into a tissue before the nociceptors will depolarize in this process of transduction? And the patient will first say, oh, you know, that, that actually hurts. So that's pain threshold, the point at which a pain first starts to hurt. And I think the last thing I mentioned in this introduction is pain tolerance. Pain tolerance. Now, pain tolerance is exactly what it says. It's the amount of pain a patient can tolerate before they will ask you to stop inflicting that pain. So this is done experimentally. You can be inflicting pain on someone experimentally. The point at which they draw their hand away or say, no, can you stop doing that now, please, is the point at which they're not tolerating the pain. They've reached their pain tolerance. But of course, if someone's traumatized or badly injured, their pain tolerance can be surpassed. And yet the patient is not in a position to say, oh, that hurts, stop that pain now, please. The pain will still persist. So patients can suffer pain beyond what they can tolerate, and yet they have to tolerate it. And, and of course, that's where you come in to uh, take that pain away or to reduce it and to make it tolerable again.